The iconic song, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong, lists some things on Earth to be thankful for. You got the colors of the rainbow, you got trees of green, red roses, too. But he also pointed out that you could see those colors in the sky. And he was right. So we are extending his sentiment to the entire universe, because there's so much to be thankful for even outside of our world. Here is an appreciative stroll through the rainbow of our universe, starting with Reed and the red spot on Jupiter. It's our solar system's most recognizable planetary feature, and it may not exist 50 years from now. Jupiter's great red spot, everybody's favorite 16,000 kilometer wide, centuries old storm, is full of surprises. From its color to its duration to stunning recent observations that it may indeed be winding down. So much weirdness. But let's start with the origins of what astronomers call the GRS. Scientists think the storm on Jupiter has been raging for at least 400 years and probably longer. Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini is credited with making the first observations of it in the late 1600s. But researchers say it was probably churning long before he, or anyone else, even knew it was there. But how exactly the storm has lasted so long has baffled scientists for decades. The GRS is basically a hurricane at least twice the size of Earth. It spins counterclockwise, with winds at its edges gusting to more than 430 kilometers an hour, and it takes six days to complete a single rotation. Here on Earth, the largest storms, tropical cyclones like hurricanes and typhoons, last a few few weeks at most before sputtering out. And given our current understanding of fluid dynamics, scientists say the GRS should have disappeared centuries ago. But of course, scientists are used to studying storms on Earth, and things on Jupiter are just well, they're pretty different. For one thing, Jupiter has no surface. The planet is almost all hydrogen and helium, so unlike our world, there aren't any land masses to help break a storm system up. Plus, when studying weather on Earth, scientists tend to focus on the horizontal flow of winds, like the jet stream or the Gulf Stream. So for a long time, experts focused on the fact that Jupiter's red spot sits between two enormous currents flowing in opposite directions. But new evidence suggests some of the storm's longevity may be caused by vertical wind flows, too. Some observers now think that the downward flow of hot gases from above and the upward flow of cold gases from below may also be at work, continually feeding the system with new energy and keeping it going. But you know what else is weird? The Great Red Spot isn't actually red. For years, scientists assumed the red in the Great Red Spot was caused by phosphorus compounds that are found throughout Jupiter's atmosphere. But NASA's Cassini mission, along with experiments conducted on Earth, have shown that the color more likely stems from the breakup of other chemicals in the very top layer of the vortex. The storm's swirling clouds are probably a mixture of mostly ammonia and hydrocarbon acetylene, and in all likelihood, these clouds are really white and gray. But the top of the GRS stands many many kilometers above the clouds around it. And when sunlight hits its highest layer, scientists think that it splits those substances into compounds that produce the spot's signature color. In lab experiments, researchers have blasted this combination of gases with UV rays, mimicking the high altitude reactions that occur atop the GRS. And the result was a reddish material with the same color properties as the Jovian red spot. And finally, like I said in the beginning, no storm lasts forever. And the fact is, the Great Red Spot is shrinking quickly. When astronomers made the first rudimentary measurements of the GRS in the 1800s, they estimated it was more than 40,000 kilometers across. By the time Voyager 1 and 2 made their flybys in the late 1970s, the storm had decreased to about 23,300 kilometers. In 1995, some of the first Hubble images of the GRS measured it at 20,900. And by 2009, it was just 18,000. The most recent measurements reveal a storm that's now less than 17,000 kilometers across, and appears to be shrinking by more than 900 kilometers per year. The change is so great that what was once an easily recognizable oval is slowly morphing into more of a circle. And at this rate, it'll be gone in a few decades. And since scientists still aren't entirely clear why the storm has lasted so long in the first place, they're hard pressed to explain why it's shrinking. One theory is that small, nearby eddies are feeding off the storm, changing its internal dynamics and sapping its energy. But astronomers also admit they're just baffled, and that there may be some dynamic going on inside the superstorm that'll need a lot more study to explain. Hopefully it'll last long enough for us to figure it out. In the meantime, you might as well go take a look at it before it's gone.
At least for now, we got the red part of the rainbow solidly accounted for in Jupiter, so it's time for orange. We got orange stars, but we could also have orange space lasers. And since they're not for blowing up planet Alderaan, here's what these orange lights in the sky could be used for. The universe has been around for more than 13.7 billion years, which seems like plenty of time for another civilization to develop. But we haven't found any evidence of life, and nobody's said hello to us either. That's the Fermi Paradox. So maybe other civilizations don't exist, or maybe they're hiding. Because, theoretically, we can hide the Earth from faraway telescopes just by shooting some lasers. Over 70% of the exoplanets we know of were found with the transit method. When we point a telescope at a star, we expect to see all the light that's shining in our direction, which depends on the star's temperature, size, and how far away it is. But sometimes a planet is orbiting that star and transits, or crosses exactly between the star and our telescope. The planet blocks some of the light, creating a dip in the measurements called a transiting light curve. And a regular pattern of dips tells us that an exoplanet is probably there. So what if another civilization was using the transit method to look for us? Two astronomers from Columbia University think we can hide the Earth. In theory, we could cover up those light curve dips by shooting the right right amount of light into space in the right direction at the right time. Which sounds kind of complicated. But you wouldn't expect hiding a whole planet to be easy. So this theoretical cloaking device is based on a couple of assumptions. Like, first of all, we'd be assuming that another civilization was looking for the Earth, and that they were using the transit method. That means we'd have to cross between their planet and our sun. For that arrangement to happen, their planet would have to be lying somewhere along the ecliptic plane, which is the path the Earth is traveling on as as it orbits the sun. Not to mention, we have to think about the technology they're using to survey the sky. Take our old friend Kepler, which is a spacecraft that has found thousands of exoplanets through the transit method. Kepler uses an instrument called a broadband photometer, which collects as many photons of light as possible in a chosen range of wavelengths. Most sun-like stars emit their light at wavelengths around 600 nanometers, in the orange part of the visible spectrum. So to hide ourselves from similar technologies, we could shoot an array of lasers into space with a wavelength of 600 nanometers, and a peak power of about 30 megawatts. So big orange lasers? Check. Sometimes exoplanet surveys use spectroscopy instead of photometry, though, with telescopes that measure light at lots of different wavelengths. Astronomers can use spectroscopy to figure out what's in an exoplanet's atmosphere, because different gases absorb and reflect different wavelengths of light. So if we wanted to hide from these kind of instruments, we'd need lasers blasting light at a bunch of different wavelengths, which would get more complicated. Or we could pick a couple, like the light signatures of oxygen and ozone, which suggest there's life here and use lasers to pretend that we're just a simple, lifeless rock. Now, firing all these lasers for a long time sounds really energy intensive. But here's the thing. We only need them as long as the Earth is transiting. That depends on how the alien planet is oriented and moving relative to ours. But by these assumptions so far, the astronomers estimated a transit of around 13 hours. Which means our array of orange lasers would need to be on for 13 hours once per year. They could be on the Earth's surface, but then we'd have to consider how the Earth rotates as it transits, and the fact that our atmosphere is in the way. So our best bet might be launching this laser array into space. On the plus side, we could capture energy from the sun to power them. But that would also mean manned missions to get everything into space and put together, which isn't exactly cheap or easy. Basically, we could hide Earth with lasers if aliens exist, they're looking for us, living in the ecliptic plane, using Kepler-like surveys, and recording data for multiple years. But even if all that was true, would we want to hide? If we don't, the astronomers also mentioned that their idea could be used to broadcast a signal into space. Using similar lasers, we could distort parts of our transiting light curve to look weirdly artificial, kind of like sending a bat signal into space, on the off chance that anyone is looking. But for now, this idea from a couple astronomers remains broadcast across our internet instead of into space. So those orange lasers would give us the option for hiding from or revealing ourselves to aliens. But maybe before we get too cocky about making contact with distant worlds, we should pay attention to the things in our own backyard that we are still discovering, like the moon's tail. Here's Caitlin to tell us about the moon's yellow beacon in the sky. 
You wouldn't know it by looking at it, but it turns out that the moon has a tail. And it's not a small tail either. This thing can grow to more than 400,000 kilometers long. And like some kind of inverse werewolf, we can only detect it right around the new moon. The moon's tail was discovered by a team of astronomers in Texas during the 1998 Leonid meteor shower, which happened to coincide with the new moon. The scientists were observing the sky as usual when they noticed a big but faint yellow spot. That glowing spot was a telltale sign of excited sodium atoms in our atmosphere, which emit yellow light Light when they go back to their normal state. By tracing the tail of the sodium, the astronomers realized that it was coming from the moon, and Earth was passing through a stream of particles being whisked off its surface. That was exciting, and not just because they'd discovered that the moon had a tail. These atoms were coming from something that astronomers had been wanting to know more about for a while. The moon's atmosphere. Because it turns out the moon has an atmosphere too. It's a very thin atmosphere to be sure, but still, the surface of the moon is not the total vacuum that we might imagine. And astronomers have a special name for this incredibly thin atmosphere. An exo Sphere. So where did it come from? Some of the particles in the exosphere come from a process called outgassing, where radioactive elements beneath the moon's surface release gases as they decay. Potassium-40, for instance, releases argon. But the gases can also be released by sputtering, which is when solar wind or small meteorites hit the surface and dislodge some of the gas that's trapped underneath. That's where the sodium is coming from. But the sodium doesn't hang around on the moon for very long. Our faithful little rocky friend is simply too small to have enough gravity to hold on to all of these particles. And it doesn't have any way to protect them from being stripped away by solar wind. So the pressure from the sun's radiation sweeps the sodium out behind the moon, forming a long, teardrop-shaped tail. So now we know where the tail comes from, but there are still some open questions, like how exactly the sodium escapes from the surface, and whether or not a meteor shower makes the tail bigger with all those meteorites knocking out more gas. In 2006, a team of astronomers began a two-and-a-half-year-long study to answer these questions. They measured the brightness of the moon's tail over 31 new moons, trying to figure out whether things like fluctuations in solar wind or meteor showers affected it. They thought they'd be able to isolate one factor as the main influence on the tail. But they couldn't. What they found was that nothing changed all that much. The brightness stayed roughly the same for all 31 months. The difficulty here is that we can only study the moon's tail during the new moon, because that's the only time that the moon is directly between us and the sun. Since the tail is being pushed away from the sun by solar wind, when the moon is new, it's basically blowing right in our face. Of course, it hits the day side of the Earth first, but the planet's magnetic field pulls the tail in and extends it all the way around to the night side, where we can see the stream of sodium. But in order to get a closer, clearer view of this thing, in 2013, NASA launched LADEE, short for the Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer. The size of a small car, the probe orbited the moon for about 140 days, collecting data on the moon's exosphere, including its tail, before crashing into the lunar surface in April of 2014. Researchers aren't finished analyzing all of the data yet, but we're already starting to get some important insights. For instance, LADEE found the amount of sodium in the exosphere actually does change throughout the lunar cycle, probably because of variations in solar wind. LADEE also also found the first direct evidence that meteor showers do increase the density of the sodium in the moon's tail. Even after four and a half billion years palling around together, it turns out we still have a lot to learn about our little buddy up there. So good night, moon. Tail. So if the moon's been hiding a tail, what else is hiding out there? Other habitable planets? Here I am to explain how we would uncover the green vegetation hiding on exoplanets. We have found a lot of exoplanets outside of our solar system. We found at least thousands. But until recently, it didn't look like we'd know whether those exoplanets are habitable until we could send a space probe or satellite to collect more information. Now we have LOOP, the Lunar Observatory for Unresolved Polarimetry of the Earth. It's a powerful camera that scientists plan to send to the moon and take pictures of Earth in 2022. They will use our planet to create a template of what they might see on potential habitable exoplanets. And that moon's eye view will take us one step closer to finding planets like ours without leaving Earth. If certain conditions on Earth have made it possible for it to support human life, then it makes sense to look for similar things on exoplanets. Based on what we know about Earth, we might expect habitable exoplanets to have bodies of water, land masses, an atmosphere with clouds and oxygen, and vegetation. Loop will take images of Earth as if it were an exoplanet and send them to scientists so they can can gather information about those qualities. They'll be able to use these pictures to see sunlight being reflected in different ways over time by clouds, gases, and plants on Earth to make a template of its rotation, weather patterns, and seasons. It's been tough to gather this kind of information about exoplanets from light in the past because it's hard to separate a star's glare from the exoplanet's polarization data. That's the direction of the light waves coming from the exoplanet. From what we have learned so far, exoplanets are very diverse. Some have 
have surfaces of lava, while others are puffy, with styrofoam-like densities. And getting more polarization data with LOOP will help tell us even more. Like, if we want to know about an exoplanet's atmosphere, the direction of the light can give us the information we need. Some of the light we see in images of exoplanets is starlight that's reflecting off of the exoplanet, and some is light that's coming straight from the star itself. It's usually hard to figure out the difference between all that light. But scientists will be able to use polarization data to separate them more, because the light coming from an exoplanet is polarized, meaning the light is coming from one unified direction, while the starlight is unpolarized or coming from multiple directions. When starlight passes through the atmosphere of an exoplanet and gets scattered, or when it's reflected off of an exoplanet's surface, polarization usually increases by up to 10 percent. And on some planets, light could have to pass through clouds in the atmosphere. Polarization data can help researchers identify clouds because they block an exoplanet's polarized light from reaching the camera. And if it's a lucky exoplanet, clouds can even be characterized by the presence of rainbows. The rainbows we know and love on Earth generally live in the Roy G. Biv family. This is the result of sunlight hitting water droplets in the air and refracting and reflecting off of them at different angles. But if clouds are made of different gases, the rainbow spectrum shifts. Using this data, we'll be able to figure out what the clouds are made of and where the clouds are on the exoplanet. And speaking of gas, the most important habitability signal might be how much oxygen there is on an exoplanet. Loop images will be able to help scientists estimate the amount of oxygen by combining cloud and water data. Oxygen and hydrogen make water, so if there's not much water, but there is oxygen, it's likely that the oxygen is in the atmosphere. And that could signal that there are plants creating oxygen on the exoplanet. Below the atmosphere, we can also figure out if the exoplanet has continents and oceans. We can learn if there are continents on an exoplanet, because light can become unpolarized when it reflects off of rough surfaces like rock. Oceans, on the other hand, reflect light at consistent angles that are specific to water. When there's enough wind to create waves, the pattern of this reflection of light becomes broader. The faster the wind, the broader the light pattern. Using this knowledge, scientists will even be able to study whether there are white caps and the direction of the waves. We can also identify oceans by color alone. The angle of light coming from an exoplanet with an ocean makes it appear blue, white, and red. And colors can also tell us about vegetation. Plants here on Earth usually have chlorophyll, a pigment that gives them a green color. And it also happens to help capture light for the plants to use, along with carbon dioxide, to make energy and oxygen. So any plants on exoplanets that convert light into oxygen might have something like green chlorophyll, too. But it's even more conclusive to get data on an exoplanet's vegetation red edge, which is the light that's close to, but just outside the range of red light that humans can see. Scientists think that plants on Earth might reflect green light and near red light because it's inefficient to use it for photosynthesis. Since this is the part of the light spectrum where chlorophyll and the things made by chlorophyll reflect light, oxygen-producing plants on exoplanets could reflect light in a similar way. Since we know what kinds of gases are in Earth's atmosphere and where its continents, oceans, and vegetation are, scientists can overlay what Loop captures about Earth with the knowledge we already have. Then they'll have a template for what it would look like to take pictures of similar things on exoplanets. With Loop, we'll be able to figure out the likelihood of exoplanet habitability from a distance. We won't have to send a satellite or space probe light years away to an exoplanet. All of the benefits of interplanetary travel from the comfort of our own planet. Even on other planets, chlorophyll might be the greenest thing in the universe. But when it comes to the bluest thing in the universe, Neptune has to be in the running. That planet's hue is a mystery for astronomers. Here are some potential causes that researchers have thought up. Neptune is probably the most underrated planet in the solar system. I mean, it's almost four times larger than Earth, has super intense storms, and in a lot of ways, we barely know anything about it. We've only visited the planet once, when Voyager 2 did a flyby back in 1989. And because it's too far to clearly see with telescopes, it's still shrouded in mystery. Like, scientists can tell us exactly what elements are chilling in some ancient lake bed on Mars, but they can't tell us why Neptune is so blue. To figure this stuff out, we need to send an orbiter there, and there's a pretty compelling case for why we should. And here are four big mysteries it could help solve. If Neptune is famous for anything, it's for being strikingly blue. Like Uranus, it gets its color from the little bit of methane in its atmosphere, which reflects the blue wavelengths of light coming from the sun. Except that's not the whole story. Neptune is actually 
too blue to be colored by methane alone. Uranus even has more methane in its atmosphere than Neptune does, about 2.3% compared to 1.5%. But it's a much lighter color. So this suggests that there's another component to Neptune's atmosphere we don't know about. But since the planet is so far away, it's hard to take the measurements we need with telescopes. A new orbiter with better instruments than we had during the Voyager 2 flyby would almost definitely be able to figure it out, no problem. Neptune has an extremely strong magnetic field, almost 30 times more powerful than Earth's. It's also misaligned. Compared to the axis the planet rotates on, its magnetic field is tilted about 47 degrees. And we're not sure why. Uranus has the same problem, but they're the only planets in the solar system that do. According to a 2000 2004 study in the journal Nature, which was based on computer models, the tilt could happen if Neptune's interior is different from most of the other planets. Specifically, if it has a liquid core instead of a solid one like Earth. Solid cores don't allow magnetic field lines to fluctuate as much, so if Neptune doesn't have one, its field lines could get all tangled up and ultimately misaligned. But there's also plenty of evidence that Neptune actually does have a solid core, and other more recent models suggest that the magnetic field issue might really be caused by a special type of conductive hydrogen close to the planet's surface. We can keep building models and collecting data from Earth, but paying Neptune another visit would help pin down some real answers to our questions. Since Neptune is the farthest planet from the Sun, you'd think it would also be the coldest, but it's not. That honor actually goes to Uranus, where the temperature around its cloud tops is about negative 220 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, at Neptune, the temperatures are closer to negative 210 degrees. Admittedly, that's not a huge difference, but considering Neptune is around one and a half times as far from the Sun as Uranus is, or more than 1.5 billion kilometers farther, it's strange that the planet wouldn't be colder. When you combine that with infrared measurements taken from Voyager 2, which suggests the planet is radiating heat, it looks like something is warming Neptune's interior. We just don't know what it is. Over the years, papers have suggested it's being heated by its moon Triton, which could pull on the planet and generate heat from friction. And a 2017 paper in Nature Astronomy suggested the heat could be coming from sinking diamonds, of all things. That idea says that the pressure is so high inside Neptune that carbon atoms get compressed into diamonds. Then, as those heavy minerals sink toward the planet's core, they generate friction that causes things to heat up. And while that would be Awesome. It's hard to know for sure unless we take more measurements up close. Finally, Jupiter's great red spot might get credit as the most famous storm in the solar system, but Neptune has a pretty cool one too. Or at least it used to. When Voyager 2 showed up in 1989, it took photos of the so-called great dark spot. It was a huge, swirling storm roughly the size of Earth, and it had winds up to 2,400 kilometers per hour or so. Except when we observed Neptune again in the 1990s, this time using the Hubble Space Telescope, it had disappeared. We weren't able to confirm any new storms of that magnitude on Neptune until 2016, when Hubble spotted another one in its southern hemisphere. But there's still not much we can do from Earth to study it. Since Neptune is so far away, it's difficult to observe these storms, let alone get data on them. And Hubble also has lots of other things to study, so it's not like we can train it on Neptune 24-7. So far, the most we can say is that storms on Neptune aren't very consistent. They show up in different parts of the planet, drift in different ways, and come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. With an orbiter, we'd be able to get much more detailed data, like how Juno can study Jupiter storms up close. But without one, we'll just have to keep admiring these blurry features from a distance. Thanks to advances in telescopes, there's a lot we can learn about other planets from Earth. But when it comes to something as far as Neptune, detailed observations become really difficult. Our current telescopes won't cut it, so to solve these mysteries, we're just gonna have to pay the planet another visit. All we need now is an orbiter, so if you happen to have a rocket and a functional spacecraft at hand, leave us a comment. Or maybe just call NASA. But while blue Neptune is a gas giant, purple planets might be something else entirely. And yes, they are really a thing. Let's hear it from Reed. In 2013, astronomers figured out an exoplanet's color for the first time. Its name is HD 189733b, and as far as we can tell, it's blue. From outside our solar system, Earth would look blue, too, with some green mixed in if you could look a little more closely. But that might not have always been the case. Some scientists think that about 3.5 billion years ago, all that green and possibly some of that blue might have been 
purple. And the idea is giving us new clues in our search for life elsewhere in the universe. These days, almost all life that gets its energy from the sun does so by using the pigment chlorophyll. It's famously green, hence all the green plants you see around you. When sunlight hits chlorophyll, some of the light gets absorbed, and that extra energy pushes an electron to a higher energy level. If a nearby molecule captures that electron, suddenly you can do all sorts of chemical reactions and produce other molecules molecules that cells can use as energy. That's called phototrophy, which literally means light eating, and it evolved about 2.7 billion years ago. Light that uses chlorophyll for this process can also capture carbon dioxide and produce oxygen, which we call photosynthesis. Considering just how green the Earth is, it's clearly a successful strategy. But it also doesn't really make sense. Chlorophyll looks green because it reflects green light while absorbing red and blue. But the sun actually emits more green light. In other words, chlorophyll is ignoring the part of the sunlight spectrum where there's more energy available, which seems kind of silly. Back in 2006, a group of American researchers proposed an explanation for this, which they've since expanded on in a few papers. Maybe the green light was already in use. See, there are some organisms that don't use chlorophyll to get energy from light. Instead, they use another type of pigment called retinol, which is basically the opposite of chlorophyll when it comes to light absorption. Retinol is purple which means it absorbs that more abundant green light and reflects red and blue. And there are some good reasons to think that microbes evolved to use retinol before chlorophyll. On a molecular level, the process of using retinol to capture energy from sunlight is relatively simple, and organisms could make retinol using systems they already had. So it's possible that, for a while, the Earth was dominated by purple organisms. The idea is that near the surface of the oceans, there was a layer of retinol-containing microbes that were absorbing basically all the green wavelengths of sunlight. So in the waters below, where there was still some space, the light would have been mostly red and blue. In which case, it would make total sense for the life that evolved to live there to absorb those wavelengths. They'd have worked with what light was available. But in the end, chlorophyll took over. Because sure, there's less light available in the red and blue parts of the spectrum, but overall, it turns out chlorophyll is much more energy efficient. Among other things, the more complex process that it uses can capture carbon dioxide and produce oxygen, which is super useful for all kinds of chemical reactions. It's also worth noting that oxygen produced by the organisms that used chlorophyll led to an environment where more complex life could evolve, including us. So that's nice. There are still certain types of microbes that use retinol, like hollow bacteria that live in very salty environments, which makes for some awesome purple lakes. But overall, green is where it's at. Now, we have no idea if the Earth actually used to be purple. The thinking behind it makes sense, but it's mainly been proposed by one group of researchers, and so far we don't really have any proof. There could be other explanations for why chlorophyll doesn't absorb green light. Like, we know too much light can sometimes be harmful. But even if it's just a possibility, the idea that a purple planet could exist is important for astronomers searching for signs of extraterrestrial life. If you're looking for evidence of green plants like we see here on Earth, your best bet might be to scan for what's known as the vegetation red edge an area of the spectrum where there's a sharp increase in the light being reflected. That's because red light, which chlorophyll absorbs, is right next to the infrared part of the spectrum, which cells reflect. But purple life would look different. Instead of a red edge, it would create a green edge, a sudden change in how much light it's reflecting as light transitions from red, which retinol reflects, to green, which retinol absorbs. Our telescopes still aren't very good at taking direct images of exoplanets, but there are plans for more powerful instruments that could do it, like a space telescope concept called the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory, or HABEX. In the meantime, by studying retinol-based life in different environments, we can learn more about how they evolved and whether they could have once dominated life on Earth. And someday, when we're finally looking through those next-gen telescopes, it might be worth keeping an eye out for a purple planet. Imagine a purple Earth crawling with retinol-filled organisms. What a wonderful world that would be, Louis! For more awesome colors in the sky, you can watch our video about how Joan Feynman demystified auroras. And thanks for spending the holidays with SciShow Space. Or whenever you're watching this. That too.